Okay, good morning and good afternoon, where your time zone is. I'm Marnie Klippinger from the Marketing Science Institute, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to MSI's first four members by members webinar. This is the first in a series of webcasts on subjects related to MSI's current research priority topics. And my member company, Millward Brown, has kindly agreed to host our first webinar. I'd like to introduce you to our speakers, Jane Dow and Jolene McGoldrick, who will present insights from Millward Brown's most recent ad reaction study on unique mobile audience segments, who they are, how they use mobile, their receptivity to marketing, what motivates them to take an action or make a purchase. Jay Dow is Director, North America of Firefly, Millward Brown's global quantitative practice. He spent almost 20 years as a consumer evangelist and joined Firefly in 2012, where she leads qualitative research and oversees digital innovation. Jolene McGoldrick is Director of Research at Dynamic Logic, Millward Brown's digital practice. Jolene was an early member of the Dynamic Logic team and has spent more than 10 years studying how audiences respond to digital advertising. She currently focuses on emerging technologies and new innovations to test audiences' experiences with advertising. Jane and Jolene are going to present for approximately 35 minutes and then take questions. Once again, we ask those of you who are listening to put your phones on mute by pressing star 6 and to use the chat feature in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to send questions to Sarah. Sarah will host a Q&A with our speakers at the end. Jay Jolene, thank you so much for agreeing to be with us and for sharing your findings today. We look forward to hearing your insights about mobile users. Well, thank you for that kind of introduction, Marnie. It's, not, it's our pleasure to be here, and we look forward to sharing this information. Uh, today, we are going to cover, as, as promised, the state of mobile usage, um, behavior and favorability, and then talk to you a bit about demographics um, and how they affect mobile advertising favorability. We'll take some time to go beyond de demographics and discuss um, sort of and introduce to you these mobile types and how these types are affecting receptivity in mobile advertising. And then from there, we'll talk more about how these audience expectations for mobile advertising impact brand. And lastly, we will round off today's uh, conversation with best practices for brand engagement in the mobile advertising space. The mobile action study is one that we conducted and published results in December of 2012. This was a, a part of a series of studies that have been done every two years within uh, Dynamic Logic and then retanding into the Millward Brown family. We're looking at and taking a deep dive at effectiveness of advertising in, in different digital platforms and then understanding its impact on brand. Here we focused on mobile. The first part of our study was quantitative. We looked at both general population and then also uh, smart smartphone tablet users and did kind of an overall um, understanding on their mobile usage levels and did a comparison in that regard and then moved into, um, into specific user behaviors and their impact through surveys. And ended up uh, doing conversations with these folks uh, and on those smartphone tablet users that have a positive affinity for mobile advertising, we had them participate in a um, in a blog of sorts to facilitate not only their conversations about the role of mobile advertising in their experience, but also then its ultimate impact on brand. And we were able to connect with uh, 25 people and bring that into 15, 60 minute conversations. And out of that came some uh, five key uh, findings. First is the most obvious, is that mobile is indispensable. Um, this is perhaps obvious to the casual observer, um, but what gives it color is the meaning it has in people's lives. The utility, the convenience of mobile devices are indispensable. And we heard people give their device the role of a companion or best friend. And in that context, that is how we are going to we are we're going to use that context to talk about how you should include it in your advertising efforts. This ending was around um, was around mobile users and their tolerance for mobile advertising. They're not feeling universal love for brands in this space, and deservedly so. As we noted in our third key 
finding that despite the disruptions and intrusions, they sincerely want brands to succeed because they know when a brand does it well, they win. Fourth key finding was around the way for brands to start building this love with consumers through mobile. And this is by simply meeting their expectations for confident, targeted, and valuable experiences. And finally, our fifth key finding, it was clear to us that those brands that apply certain best practices to mobile efforts are going to be able to build meaningful connections to their brand. And we're going to share those with you today. So number one, Mobile is indeed indispensable, and we're finding that usage is on the rise. We first looked at how people use their mobile devices, and we found that they use them very differently. Smartphones are the everything device. They're used in equal shares, talking, texting, surfing the web, using apps. And tablets are much more, you know, the ed edutainment device. There's more for consuming content. This is particularly important in mobile advertising and regarding mobile types because it suggests to us that people's mindsets with each of these devices are different. And when they're on the smartphone, they're goal-directed. Marketing content is often perceived as an interruption, uh, a, something getting in the way of completing a task. When they're using their tablet, it's much more re relaxed um, and it carries a stronger receptivity. We all see that all forms of contact that the brand drive people to their mobile devices to continue that contact. Recommendations, TV and print ads, and online and offline store exposure are most likely to drive users to visit a store website for the brand, download the app, or follow the brand. But says they start clicking. Only 10% of respondents said they'd click on or interact with a mobile. And only 14% have visited the brand's website, and only 11% search for the brand after seeing a mobile display ad. This suggests to us that display ads alone are not a mobile strategy. And instead, we need to think about mobile along a continuum of display ads, mobile websites, apps, etc. And mo mobile display ads, they need to work in concert with the brand's total mobile presence. We also need to consider what makes mobile so special to people. It really should come as no surprise that people reportedly loved their mobile devices. For many, it projects into their very self in interesting and sometimes strange ways. And for many, their mobile is beyond essential. This idea that someone's life could collapse in the absence is not only dramatic, but telling to its utility. And there, there's what it does for them. It is multi-talented. Through access, they have freedom to do what they want. Beyond that, it's what mobile allows them to do to become. And for some, this is um, life-changing. They're superhuman. Or by being able to solve problems, they feel truly smart. And most of all, they are fun and they are having fun. Experience is not, we're, we're just not seeing this translate to mobile advertising. And there's, there's likely committed to a couple of things over the course of the last couple of years. You know, the formats have evolved, and we've seen adoptions of, th adoptions of different areas change. Um, and, and through that evolution, we've seen, bless you, and bless you again. <laughs> and through that, through that evolution, we've seen the disruption in the experience um, become more significant. So this leads us to wonder if brands are really welcome the space, and then what needs to change. To understand where there could be openings, where there could be receptivity, we did some of the standard analysis. We looked at, looked at demographics, and just a reminder, just put your phone on mute if it's not already. So we looked at um, demographics, and we looked at could, could the keys he here. Uh, sorry, if there's one person who could put their phone on mute, that would be spectacular. Thank you. Um, uh, we looked at the... Uh, I'm half listening. I'm doing things while listening. <laughs> Want to just do a quick reminder? Sorry. This is taking it. Hi, apologies. Uh, if you could just please put your phones on mute or press star six. Thank you. All right. So let's get over there. So we're looking to see are there um, demographics that could provide us some um, insight for where there's receptivity. Is it age that's driving receptivity? Is it gender? Um, is it device usage? 
So we looked at the sort of basics, and we found that, that some of these things were true. There are definitely differences in favorability by age. So not surprisingly, which is intuitively intu correct, I think, we see that younger audiences are more favorable to all formats. So look at that light green bar, right? That's the 18 to 34 group. Across all formats, they have higher favorability than the 35 to 49 group, than the 50-plus group, with the most favorable format being uh, social news. So I think age is part of the equation, and I think that's that's the known. Most of us would have intuited that. Then we also see there's a little bit of receptivity towards gender, that men tend to be more receptive um, across all formats uh, than women do. Um, the closest there being social news feeds, almost equal um, opinions. In all other formats, there's generally about a seven percentage point difference. Again, both of these are still low, right? Gender and age, either if it's the magic bullet yet. Um, and then finally, we looked at um, device format. Um, and we look at, you know, is there a particular device that's driving favorability? Um, are Apple users more favorable than uh, Android users? And what we found is there's a little bit of an opening there, right? There's people who are double device users, double Apple users. Um, they tend to have more favorable um, opinions of mobile formats across the board, particularly high with um, in ads and particularly high with social news feeds. But none of these things sitting on their own gave a real answer as to where the favorability lies. So, um, we did a cluster analysis and we looked at mobile types and we noticed some, some very profound differences by types that I'll let Jane address. So within that we identified five different types that were probably the most relevant to our work. Excuse me. In mobile, and three that we're going to focus on to you, uh, focus on today, the mobile sophisticates are probably those that you would expect to be a mobile audience. Um, they were tech savvy. Uh, that for them, the, the mobile is something that they, that can replace their computer. Generally younger and male. They need their their their, their, their mobile experience as sort of the central part of their life. The second type that we focused in on was mobile effectives. And these folks are much more um, utility driven. For them, it's a tool for organizing their life and their household. And for them, what's important is that there's kind of this, this um, tangible exchange, this quid pro quo. And finally, there were the mobile pro, uh, pragmatics, which are probably the hardest audience to reach because they aren't really owned by their mobile. You know, they, they have this um, attitude that they, they view as advertising as a means to an end, and it allows them to get a lot of different things for free. Um, and so we're going to take a moment to just deep dive into each of these because the distinctions um, – I think there's a lot of assumptions about what a mobile audience looks like, and the distinctions between these three types are really important in, in kind of thinking about your mobile marketing efforts. The mobile sophisticates, as I mentioned, they are probably the most stereotypical mobile user, um, and I think the ones that, they, that, that most marketers assume are using their mobile devices um, when they're talking talking to them through their advertising. They see their mobile as an extension of themselves, and it really is their connector. I asked um, all of them sort of a similar question about, you know, do you, own your, do you own your mobile or does your mobile own you? And these folks are really owned by their mobile device. It is a portal into um, their social lives, and it is, it is their personal assistant and their entertainment source all into one. Um, their attitudes relate to mobile marketing, they are receptive to it and they want it to be great. And the reason they want it to be great is because they've had a taste of what great looks like. And they know that when it, the experience is good, they'll benefit from it. Um, what is worth noting in some of these key attitudes about mobile or some of the things that stand out is that the 63% um, note that they have a mobile device and they really don't see a, a mobile computer need see the need for a computer. We see these numbers continue to be high both in how they consider their mobile device at work and at home. And this is probably where we'll see some the biggest difference with differences with the other types. Um, we asked them also using archetypes, which are a tool that we use in qualitative to help personify um, a concept so that it feels more human and more relatable. And when we talk to them about their role of mo the role of mobile in their um, 
sort of in their shopping experiences. It was really a companion. And what you have to remember in that instance is, is what a companion is in real life. It is, it, is, it is literally your best friend and somebody who is bringing information to you and wanting to add value to your life and make things really interesting for you and somebody where you feel something where you feel you have an exchange. Um, these sophisticates are likely to engage with the brand on the mobile after any form of brand exposure. It is their, their go-to source. In contrast, the mobile effectives are much more utilitarian. They're looking at for something that is um, goal. They are goal directed, and they're looking for something that helps them achieve their goals. They expect everything in their in mobile to make their lives easier, and that it will help things in their life run more efficiently. Um, this, this, it's not surprising that they are largely of mom age. Um, you know, more more female skew, more female, um, and they run a bit of mass affluent. And and also not surprising that the sentiment is that you know they're on the go all the time and out with their family, and they need some access point. They need something that's just going to make everything easier at their fingertips. I asked you to keep in mind the attitudes about mobile, and this is where I want to call it out. You'll note there's been a, a bigger difference in how they perceive their mobile device relative to their computer. So again, this is really an efficiency tool when they're on the go. But we see at home where it's got numbers skyrocket, where it is indispensable to their family and it's a primary tool for organizing their personal life. And, it, and they have this very strong belief that this device is what makes them efficient. We see in stark contrast at work, it is less important for the effectives. Again, when we ask them about the role of mobile, for them, they, they, their role of mobile is that it's a heroine. That they are, you know, you think about what a heroine is, and a heroine is something that really makes your life easier and makes things, um, uh, saves the day, if you will. And that really is the personification of mobile for the effectives. Um, for engagement with brands, convenience and savings are the driver and motivator. They're trying to get things done, and, and, and if you can create savings for them and you can make their lives easier, you will win. Finally, there is the mobile pragmatics. I mentioned before, they sort of are, uh, you know, have this laissez-faire relationship with their mobile. In contrast, where the mobile sophisticates answer the question that they're owned by their device, in contrast, um, the mobile pragmatics state that they actually, you know, they, they, they own their device. It, they use it when they want it, and their life does not revolve around with it. For them, it makes uh, connecting with family and friends easier, and it just it helps them manage a few things more efficiently. But, you know, other than that, they could take it or leave it. Um, they expect their device to work for them, and they just don't want the intrusions that are unexpected. Again, calling out some of those key attitudes about mobile, a whopping 4% have said that the mobile device is, is, is sort of in contrast, um, not their computer. Like, it is crazy, the contrast between the sophisticates and the pragmatics. We also see this continuous low numbers through the attitudes about mobile at work at home. And we're sort of, we, we some similarities um, at home around the mobile device being indispensable and always on the go, um, and that they have that belief that it makes them more efficient, but it doesn't have the same stronghold that it does with the effectives and certainly not the sophisticates. When we asked, um, when we talked to pragmatics about the role of mobile, uh, it was personified as a mediator, Some, but something that is a go-between. It, it, it gets me from point A to point B, and it helps me navigate things more smoothly. Um, we're looking to connect with mobile pragmatics are sort of recommendations um, and in-store exposures are going to drive pragmatics to mobile for more information because that's where they're prompted. Again, it's that point A to point B kind of experience. Um, it's not surprising then overall that sophisticates are your most receptive audience to mobile advertising because it encompasses so much of their life. And as I mentioned before, they've had a taste of it. They know when it succeed when it when it is really when really good, they are actually the benefactors of it. And so um, as you look across all different kind of mobile formats, um, we see probably stronger stronger areas in the in-app ads and then also with mobile video ads. Um, we see start drop-offs then with your other mobile types. Again, these folks aren't in the same mindset as the 
specific heads. Um, when you are with the effectives and going into and, and, and intruding into their goal-directed life, um, unless, is it helpful to get from A to point B? It's going to see, be seen as, in a negative way. The same with the pragmatic. Uh, as we had, we sort of briefly talked about, um, there are a lot of different things that drive each of these type two mobile. The sophisticates, really any brand touch point is going to drive them to mobile. Um, however, with effective, they're going to look for recommendations. They're going to look for things that help them create. Um, that are, are going to create some efficiencies. And, and finally, for the pragmatics, if they're looking for more information, it's going to drive them to their mobile. So let's talk about motivation in the mobile space. So to take a step back, when we're talking about motivators, what I want to tell you about is, is expectations that emerge through the uh, course of our research. Because I think expectations is really the key to getting it right with mobile. Um, and there's a quote here I want to reference, really more as a challenge to us. So in April, Eric Schmidt said, in every corridor, in every way, mobile technology, phones and tablets are exceeding everybody's expectations. So I think what this means is the challenge is now for marketers and advertisers to deliver that content that exceed expectations as well. Because what we see is that when you can exceed expectations, when you have a great mobile presence, the stakes are huge. If you look at this slide, this shows you um, the top 20% in green and the bottom 20% in red of all of the campaigns tested. If you look at the top 20%, there are huge increases in aid brand awareness, mobile ad awareness, message association, brand favorability, and purchase intent across the board there. Um, those numbers are a marketer's dream. This is mobile done right. But it also shows you that the stakes are, are, are high if you do mo mobile marketing wrong as well. So for the bottom 20% of all campaigns, there is no increase in mobile ad awareness, no increase in message association, and actually significant decreases um, in unfavorability and purchase intent. Because what this tells us is that when we do mobile wrong, when we fail to meet user expectations, we can actually uh, do damage to the brand. What are those expectations? Well, across the board, uh, and this, as we mentioned, what we're talking about is uh, the research done in the U.S., but it's interesting to note that we did research in uh, 15 or, uh, 14 other countries as well. And these expectations emerged universally. And there are three of them that we think are really the motivators um, to getting mobile right, to meeting these expectations. So the first, well, the first is intuitive. It's that mobile will be confident. But fortunately, we think that it comes up over and over again because too often mobile is not confident. Mobile uh, is often not technically confident. It ashes, links don't work. Um, and we're not, is mobile is often not socially confident. It always um, have the respect for the audience that engenders positive feelings. What's the second expectation? It's that mobile will know who I am and target accordingly. But this was a little bit more of a surprise to us. But we, we found over and over again was this assumption or this expectation of built-in intelligence. Uh, qualitative, uh, qualitative respondents summed it up really well when they'd say, we know that mobile tracks everything we do, everywhere that we are. We know that you have this information about us. So if you have this information about us, use it to send us the appropriate content. Uh, send us things that are relevant to us, both personally and uh, geographically. Mobile will offer an exchange of tangible value. Um, mobile will recognize that it's using my device, it's using my data, it's using how many texts I'm allowed, um, it's using my battery life, it's using my time, it's using my intention, uh, my attention in a more intrusive format than we've perhaps ever seen before. So you, as the marketer, offer me something in exchange for this. Um, because when it's done right, it has huge benefits for the brand. Okay, the first expectation is confidence. And as I mentioned, there's two forms of confidence. There's technical confidence and there's social confidence. So when there's technical incompetence, like slow and incompatible apps, mobile websites that keep promoting the brand, uh, mobile websites that keep promoting the app even though you don't want to download the app, content or links that don't work, 
Um, about one in three respondents says that this technical incompetence can damage their opinion of brand. It's as the technical incompetence is imputed on the brand itself. Um, but worse than technical incompetence is social incompetence. So what social incompetence? Social incompetence is reminding your manners in the mobile space, um, requesting too much information, seeing unwanted ads or posts, not providing a way to opt out. These are forms of social incompetence, and they're more damaging. About 50, almost 50% of respondents say that this social incompetence, this risk or this, this intrusion, can actually be uh, can actually damage their opinion of the brand. So to getting Right. Okay. The second confidence. The, the second um, second point. Second point is relevance. And when we talk about relevance, it's really recognition of two things. It's recognition. And just by the way, we'll pause for a second. If your phone is not already on, on mute, please place it on mute now because I don't know. I think we're still getting some background noise. Thank you. Um, so there's two there's two forms of this relevance. There's uh, geographic relevance. I see that for respondents who um, visit mobile web once a day or more. Right? Right? These are people who are going online to search. These are people who are downloading apps once a day or more. That 36% of them say that they're willing to share their geographic location to get the content right. Um, and 29% of them are saying, we want to see more uh, location-based content in marketing. So it shows that there's both, both a receptivity to information and also a desire to get more information um, that's geotargeted. There's a con uh, there's a expectation of, of personal relevance. Um, it's how you as a brand can be uh, relevant in someone's daily personal experience. Um, what people want to see more of when we ask them, what are the brands that you want to see more of um, in the mobile space? The brands were brands to which they had an everyday connection. It's brands like uh, local restaurants and retail stores and food products. So there's there's two takeaways here. Takeaway is that these brands should really increase their mobile presence. But the other brand is that this idea of daily personal relevance is something that as marketers we all have to ask ourselves when we step into the mobile web. So how can we make our app something that people don't just download but that they use on a regular basis? How can we be that companion that we're providing something that's helping them to meet their mobile goals? And value. Um, and value was another thing that interestingly in every culture where we field this study, right, we fielded this study in Nigeria, in South Africa, in India, in France, in all of these countries, this cut of value very clearly emerged. Right? We saw people express concerns about I, 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 my, my battery is being, being eaten up by this. I only have a certain number of text messages. I only have a certain amount of data. So if you're going to use these things, can you give me something in return? So obviously, the more tangible, the better. 44% of audiences said they wanted to see more deals and coupons. But it also suggests, as you go further down that mobile value spectrum, that there's other forms of value that can be provided by marketers. Free tools, such as shopping lists and reminders, are particularly powerful for your effective audience who is very goal-directed. Interest-based information like recipes and sports scores are also desired. Location-based information is seen as something value to tell people about store locations and about promotions. And somewhat surprisingly, it's the things like fun features and maybe unsurprisingly latest product news that people aren't really considering something of value that, that they want to see more of in the mobile space. So how do we execute value? Well, I would posit to you that there's three things that we should consider when we execute value. It's mobile typology. It's balancing the intrusion with the discount. And it's being sensitive to issues of control of the offer. So at first point, look at the typology. We see that particularly for our pragmatic group, our effective group. And remember, our effective groups also tend to look a little bit like primary purchasers, right? They're they're women, 35 to 49. Um, they they are the on the go group of people. These people, more than half of them, uh, will get more deals and coupons uh, from brands. We have to caveat that, right? There's a, there's a challenge here um, in how you act execute this. So the first challenge was, really came to us from one of the qualitative respondents that made aware of 
this difference. That the degree of intrusion really has to match the discount. So one of our correspondents gave us an example that she was waiting for a text message, um, and this text from a brand popped up saying, here's, 20%, here's a coupon for 20% off. I'm sure perceived as a brand, this is, this is a great offer. That's why we're sending you a text. But to her, that value was not enough for the amount of interruption that she had. So it, was, it ended up being perceived as a negative thing. Another issue there is, um, is being sensitive to the control of the offer. So offering something that's just for a specific product can often be seen negatively because people walk the same line, as you mentioned before, in the archetypes. It walks, watch the spine between being a bully, right, of taking control of your device when there's something else entirely that you want to do. And so there needs to be some caution by marketers that you're not dictating what the next step is in the mobile space, that you're giving um, users some flexibility and control of their mobile experience. So how do we put these things into action? What are some best practices for our display ads, for our websites, and for our apps. And what we'll offer to you in this next section is um, some, some guidelines from what we see, not just from what came up in Ad Reaction, but also from our normative database um, of mobile ads we've tested to date. So again, with mobile display ads. Mobile display ads are perhaps the most challenging aspect of a mobile presence. Um, and, and often they are, they are not executed well. And we think that part of why they're not executed well is because there's some some condition that they're analogous to uh, to digital ads. Um, and so what we see is when those mobile ads are really just resized or formatted uh, digital ads, so resized or reformatted 300 by 250 or skyscraper ad, those ads don't do as well. This is a discrete medium and requires its own creative execution. So just shrinking something down to fit onto a smartphone or a tablet is generally uh, an unsuccessful strategy. We also want to be careful of the, of the cognitive load that we're placing on mobile audiences. So remembering that there's some other reason why they're on that device than to get advertising. Right. So what doesn't work is when you show them a display ad and you are asking them to guess what um, what product it's for. You have to price, if you're going to put product shot, the product shot and the brand needs to be up front so that there's no guessing as to what this is really advertising. And another don't is to not use intrusive formats unless the context is highly relevant and offering something of value in exchange. So flips to those don'ts or what do you need to do? You need to clearly brand the creative in any frame. Um, you need to offer a clear call to action if your goal is truly to get people to click through. And you need to target as tightly as possible. And by this, I don't just mean demographic targeting, and I don't just mean behavioral targeting. I mean looking at psychographics too. So it presents both a challenge and an opportunity, and that we're adding this element of user experience and usability that's more important than it is in any other medium. So it's understanding for our target audience how they use and how they interact with their device so that you can see where there are openings for advertising receptivity. Finally, if you can do all of these things, make the ad interactive, make the ads engaging. What makes a good website? So what makes a good website is just being clear and being honest with yourself what you're dealing with. So simple really safest until network speeds improve. Remember that people go onto the mobile web um, for very goal-directed reasons. So you should be minimizing the number of taps. You certainly want to be minimizing resizing. It should be as clean and easy to, to use um, and functional. It should not outdo the online website. We have to remember that users are goal-directed. We can't value entertainment over competence. Competence has to come first to the mobile website. Already gotten so far, we've driven the mobile website that we don't want to lose them at that point. And if there's news or if there's things that are particularly relevant, those should be at the top of the mobile website. Whoops, sorry about that. Mobile apps. Um, what do mobile apps need to do? This intuitive and it is, but the most important thing is that mobile apps don't crash because they're not resource intensive. Um, acquisition with mobile is not 
the key. So when I asked people, you know, how many apps do you have? They had a lot. But how many of them do you use? And it was really, the answer was really hardly any. We can't measure it by just necessarily um, whether they download it. It also needs to, we also need to prove the daily personal relevance. Is this something that we want them to have a better relationship with? And if so, the content on the app needs to be accessible enough that it becomes a go-to device. Uh, we make the apps too complex. And we certainly not, not, coming back to this idea of social competence, we certainly should not ask for more information than we need. Any type of thing like, how did you hear about this? Or um, what's your mailing address? Mobile is not the correct format for that in any way. So I think apps should be, they be free. They should be relevant. When you offer an update or a specific type of app, it needs to clear what that's offering. If there's an update, why? Is there an update? What is the benefit to you accepting that update? Um, users need to be offered something in return. We need to surprise and delight them enough so that users uh, will come back again. And that that closes our presentation. Um, at this point, we will I will hand it over to Sarah, and we will um, ask for any questions that you have. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat window. Great, Jolene. Thanks, Jane. Um, we've gotten quite a few questions already, so appreciate everyone who sent those through. Um, first, actually, about the deck, and um, everybody was wondering whether the deck will be available, and we will put that up on msi.org following the event. So to dive into some of the specific content questions, we have a question here. Uh, do the different mobile types have different concerns about privacy? Um, general, this is Jane. Uh, generally, uh, I'm going to speak to it from a qualitative perspective. Generally, there was an assumption that there is some sort of artificial intelligence in mobile um, that has uh, that that is essentially understanding where you are and what you're doing, and therefore should be relevant. This is why there is such a high standard about um, and a high expectation of relevance um, and table value. That being said, you have a a spectrum of comfort. Um, again, I'm only speaking qualitatively because I can anecdotally what I heard from each of these different types is sophisticates because they play in the space. Their comfort level is actually uh, their threshold is much um, much lower. Or, I'm sorry, as it relates to privacy, their threshold is much higher. So they there's a great saying that I picked up at South by Southwest year, this year that was. Um, uh, if it's useful, it's not creepy, and they sort of embody that kind of idea. Well, if it's useful, it's not creepy, and you find that sort of that that as you go down that, that spectrum of through effectives and pragmatics, um, you find that anecdotally um, that threshold gets lower. Um, I think the expectation for effectiveness, uh, the effectives, is about usefulness. Again, if it's a brand that I know and it's a brand that I use. It's, it's giving me something that's useful. There's not so much um, uh, that creepy factor related to how did they get that information. And because pragmatics use case is so specific, they are less, less inclined, or the threshold being lower, less inclined and, and likely to be uh, creeped out by things that come to them in unexpected ways. Um, Jolene, do you have anything quantitatively to add to that? You know, I think Jane, that you gave that's that's a really good summary because I think it comes down to really, really more than that. We didn't delve so much into privacy. I think most of the privacy that um, we had was really brought up by users more so. Um, so I think that that summary was great. Um, here's another question: What are the drivers of users? perception that a mobile ad is socially competent. Can you dive down and talk about what specific aspects of the ad increase or decrease the perception of competence? I think, I think you know, a big part of, of social competence is being able is for marketers to be able to extrapolate something from opt-out. We see the one thing, if I had to flag one thing that really personifies social incompetence, it's the idea of getting an ad on mobile, closing out of the ad, having their interaction, having this ad show up again and again, that intrusiveness of, I told you already I'm not interested in seeing this ad and you just don't get it, is both intrusive and it's also incompetent. So I'd say that, that really the, the not opting out, not providing a way to opt out, is really just the 
probably the, the single biggest driver. And then I think the second biggest driver is really, and I think this goes back to privacy concerns, is really asking for a very minimal amount of information. While there's an expectation that sort of en masse that's collected, I think that the level between useful and creepiness is also, right, if you're using information about me en masse, that is probably okay, but when it's at a very individual level, that's the point at which we see the uh, the, the turnoff or the, the damage to the brain. And that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Jane. Um, thanks, Jolene. Here's um, one that's come through. It says, can you offer some examples of effective uses of mobile for each of the segments. So kind of by a, the segments, our, do you mean t t typologies or do you yes, mean? Yes, um, yeah, it says segments. I'm guessing typologies here. Yep. yep. Um, do, do, would you like us to call out specific um, call out uh, to call out some specific brands of where we said it worked well? Some examples of that sound qualitative. Is that where you think? You know, you know, just, well, I'll just tackle that, and we'll see where it goes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, effective again, the type, how they use their mobile is really your guide. That is your beacon to understanding sort of their engagement and what was useful. Um, and we we've actually since done a follow up study that, that explored tangible value and its meaning tangible value. So, what I'm going to do is continue based on the learnings we've gotten out of that, elaborate more because I think that that is really the pivot point in all of this. For sophisticates, because their world lives in um, they lives in in kind of this um, all encompassing mobile. Uh, um, it really is about relevance. So you know we found that um, things that were engaging from video content, you know, it could be a brand where they have um, some relationship with it or even not some relationship with it. But as long as it was sort of in an edutainment informational kind of uh, vein, it got a good receptivity. Your effectives being much more goal-directed, they teed up ads that were much more about getting stuff done. So, you know, even universally there was this, I'll bring it up because, it, and I talk about it all the time, is this Pillsbury ad who you wouldn't necessarily think that Pillsbury would be the gung-ho mobile, the mobile brand you know, pioneer. But amongst both men and women across lives, they found enormous value in this Pillsbury ad because not only did for the effectives did it help them identify what their, it, it, it was relevant and when it was served because they were usually looking for some information about what to make for dinner or looking for recipes. It served up some sort of content that was related to the content to what they were doing. It gave them an idea, and it it allowed them to not only do the shopping list, print the recipe. It had a ton of utility attached to it, so there wasn't all this extra effort for them. And I think that's what um, this is understanding the total experience is like. It's one thing to deliver an engagement. It's another thing to understand sort of what all the follow-through are going to be after that engagement. And with the pragmatics, you know, they're a tough audience. They are, the, the incentivization within that space needs to be higher for them to engage. So if they don't have a sense of brand or if they don't have a relationship with an existing brand, they really need some sort of incentive to engage with that advertising. And, um, because otherwise they're just not going to. So, um, I think we saw that actually come out in, in, in follow-up research we did where we looked specifically at reward-based reward advertising, things that sort of either offer some kind of coupon things or uh, points for engagement. Do you want to add that? I think that was a, a great summary. The only thing I'd add to it, and this is it's sort of related to the question, but a little off base, is also this idea. So Jane brought up this idea in uh, some of her slides about the continuum. One of the things that we see for a brand in total, in the total brand experience, that makes a big difference between successful and unsuccessful presence is by having the elements be unified, but having them be layered right? so that the mobile site and the mobile app are not necessarily duplicative, that the mobile app is adding something of value in addition that can't be found on the mobile website, but still with a very consistent consistent look and feel, um, that, that, is, that is just essential. Um, particularly, that's something that for sophisticates is really, still ends up being a, a huge wow factor, having these tools, following the rest of the principles, having the value there, and making it um, straightforward enough that we don't lose people. Thanks, 
Um, here's in one. So what are some things that we need to think about to get started in mobile? I think the first, the, the very first thing, if you're a brand who has not been started, who, who hasn't gotten started in mobile, really understanding for your target target audience what you can provide for them. What would they have a reason to um, to go to you in mobile? What are they looking for? How do they use the, your, their device? Right, understanding for your target demographic what their their mobile typology is it really is really critical. Um, so that you can know exactly how the type of content that you have to uh, show to them and the different ways that you can communicate with them. So I, I, I see it as the first starting part is really understanding your audience and getting their, both their needs and then also their user experience issues correct. And to build on that is really understanding the role of your brand. So if um, so much of advertising as it's evolved into the digital space has gone from a message delivery system to that one to that of a brand in service to its customers. And know that your customers want an interaction from you and it may not it may not be something that exists or it may not be something that um, already is being offered, but you can add value or create service that um, in a way that might be unique and unexpected. And so know what your central value proposition is and build on it in a in a service orientation kind of way. Okay. Another one that comes through. <laughs> We've got a number of good ones coming in, so thanks everyone and keep sending them through. Um, here's one that says, is there a danger that mobile will become merely a conduit for deals and coupons in consumers' eyes? No. I mean, it could be, right? <laughs> Any, anything's possible. If, if you interpret it, I think if you interpret it, this idea of value as I must do more coupons, yes, if, if everyone interprets interpret that way, that's correct. But it's going back to that value spectrum, and there are so many different ways you can enhance the role of your brand, right? Making the brand relevant on a regular basis, whether there's another great um, app example I like to talk about with, with Whole Foods, right? They let you enter in. Um, they have on hand, uh, and then they can give you they give you a recipe in return based on that. Like so, go ahead and buy more carrots and buy more onions and things like that. What that does is that it builds that personal relevance without actually offering not offering any discounts, they're not offering any coupons. It's something offering that's integrating their brand into people's lives. But I do think that that orientation is different, right? So I don't think the ca the takeaway is more deals and coupons. The takeaway is okay. This goes from me that been talking about myself to switching it to me that been talking about you, right? This is, mobile is much more user focused than any media that's come before it. So it's such an if you if you get away from that idea, you really have to shift the focus to the user and what is the user how do you use this device and what they expect from me. And if you as a brand can do that, I think that that it doesn't make it incumbent upon you to offer deals. There's certain brands that are never going to be able to do that. They're never going to have something that they can say, you know, percent off the purchase of this car, right, or something that's going to be compelling enough to do that. So it's just how you talk about the user rather than really about the brand. Jane, do you anything to add to that? No. no. <laughs> Great. One, two, another one. Um, how do you see the segments evolving over time, like the next few years? I'll that one. So, so, you know, part of this is I think – when we go to presentations, we hear so much about the, the youngest group, right, and that the future of mobile is all in the youngest group. But I think what it also tells us is in the older groups, their sophistication with mobile is increasing. So I think we should expect to see is, and depending upon how well mobile is executed, we should see a comfort level go up, a, a user confidence level go up, um, and an interest uh, in engaging more. So mobile is done right more and more. I think that we'll see what we'll see is engagement going up. Um, groups will potentially, um, this is just my theory on this, all start to look a little bit more like sophisticates, and sophisticates will morph into something more. I don't think sophisticates necessarily has to be the outer limit. I think groups will move to that as their, two things, as their comfort level increases, but also as their reliance on mobile increases because in the emerging markets where we ran this study, um, in, yeah, in Nigeria, where they didn't have the option of computers at all, where it was the mobile nothing, their 
activity is much higher, their interest is much higher. So I think as people use their computers potentially a little bit less and their phones a little bit more, there's actually the potential for a lot more acceptance too. Yeah. It, since given the opportunity to editorialize, it's important to note that we are talking about mobile devices, so that includes the mobile and the tablet, and these have very different use cases even within the different typologies. And even in the five years, again, I, you know, this is sort of prominent theme within South by Southwest this year where, you know, nobody's willing to make predictions about what mobile looks like. Mobile is wearable. You know, we, we know by the end, of this, <laughs> the end of this year that it can be wearable. Um, and that, you know, the, the evolution of the device. What is central in all of this is sort of knowing that, to Jolene's point, that um, the types, the, the lifestyles of these individuals are shifting and how they use the device will be central to their type of life they're living. So your factors are looking for something to organize their life. And as long as the device and technology is used in a way that gets them to that end, you're going to be able to find positive engagement and impact on brand. As such, with the sophisticates, their lifestyle is all encompassing in terms of content and social connection. The same goes true for the pragmatics, where they're sort of using technology as a means to an end. And I think those are sort of the, at the very basic, um, the technology can evolve, the, but their lifestyles stay the same. And technology will play the role in their life. All right, that's um, we're about five minutes left, and I just wanted to thank everybody for your questions. Um, if you have further questions, please email us directly. The email addresses are located on the screen right now. And I'm actually going to pass it back over to Marnie, who's going to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Jane and Jolene. That was fascinating. Um, and as, as Sarah just said, if Jane and Jolene didn't get to your questions or if there are additional things you'd like to discuss with them, they invite you to reach out to them at the email addresses on your screen. Um, and their slides as well as the entire webcast will be available for download on the MSI member website, as Sarah said. We'll send you the link. We'll send everyone who's on this call the link when they've been posted. Many thanks also to our generous hosts at Millward Brown, Susan Hickey, Gordon Weiner, and Sarah Beatty. That, this has been a, a very painless maiden voyage for MSI into the world of webinars. So thank you also to the MSI audience for, for joining us for this. We will be following up to get your feedback and comments on this webinar as well as your ideas and suggestions for future webinars. And we look forward to connecting with you all again very soon. Bye-bye now. <laughs>